Good morning, everybody. How are you coping with the heat? We're going through a bit of a, a heat wave at the moment, aren't we? It's, uh, it's incredibly warm. I was suffering from stress as a result of the heat, and so I decided enough is enough. I bought an air conditioning unit and got up early this morning in preparation for today and turned it on, and guess what? Didn't work. So I, I was starting to get a bit stressed about the very fact that we bought this brand new air conditioning unit and didn't work. But isn't it lovely that we've got air conditioning in this church? Yeah. It's a fantastic joy to have, to have that. Well, this is the second in a three-part series, obviously called Prison Break. And last week, Carl emphatically challenged us all about the need to look, look at 2013 or 2013 as a year of change, a, a, a year of growth. And today, I'm talking on a, on a very real 21st century topic, breaking free from stress. Next week, we have Michael, who's looking after us with, a, with a, a message that I'm looking forward to hearing on the subject of breaking free from worry. So that's something to look forward to next week as well. If you're over 60, and there are a few of us here, not me, but there are a few of us out there that uh, may remember a guy called Jack Davey. Now, he was a very popular radio announcer uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Jack worked long hours. He, he earned a significant salary, but he would spend more than he earned. His extravagance, reckless living, gambling, expensive cars, love for big game and fishing meant that he was perpetually in debt. He was also constantly plagued by health problems. In his late 40s and early 50s, Jack, um, Jack's health continued to deteriorate, with his doctor often warning him to cut back, to rest, to take time off. But he ignored the advice. Working harder and longer than ever as his popularity increased. He died on the 14th of October 1959 at the youthful age of 52. It was very popular, 150,000 people came to his funeral. Jack coined a phrase that uh, he himself lived by. Bite off more than you can chew and then chew like crazy. Sadly, this was his philosophy about life and it led to an early grave. And let me ask you the question this morning. Have you bitten off more than you can chew and are you chewing like crazy? Is your life out of control? Do you have too much on your plate? What is your schedule like? Are you experiencing stress as a result? In 2010, I, my family and I traveled to the United States for a, a, a holiday that we've been waiting for for many years. And I wanted to take my family to Universal Studios and we were staying in Anaheim on the other side of the city. So I hired a car, never having driven on the right side of the road before. And obviously never driven in Los Angeles before, I was feeling a little stressed, a little anxious. Uh, my heart rate was, was up. The GPS took us almost immediately onto the Santa Ana Freeway, or the I-5, as many uh, Americans know it as. It was, I would have to say, a baptism of fire. Six lanes, cars flying at far beyond what I would consider to be 100 kilometres an hour, even police cars. Uh, traffic weaving in and out, horns honking, mainly at me. My wife spent most of the time um, basically saying nothing but, slow down, watch this car, uh, uh, uh. And it was, uh, it was madness, it truly was. Why didn't we just take the bus? I don't know. <laughs> Life in the 21st century is a bit like that. It's a bit like being on that freeway. Everyone, it seems, is moving at breakneck speed. And it's hard not to get caught up in it. Otherwise, we'll be left behind. Our kids will be left behind. Or we'll miss out on that promotion. Or we won't have enough to retire on. We won't be rewarded as we should be. We often take on more than we can handle. We get addicted to adrenaline. Our business is like a badge of honour. Craig Rochelle, in his fantastic book, Weird, says most of us are living at a pace that is unsustainable. 
Thomas Kelly said this, we feel the pull of many obligations and try to fulfill them all. We are unhappy, uneasy, strained, oppressed and fearful. We shall be shallow. We have hints that, are, uh, that there is a way of life vastly richer and deeper than all of this hurried existence, a life of unhurried, unhurried serenity and peace and power. If you're constantly burdened and stressed by the weight of so many jobs, and chores and responsibilities, obligations and commitments, then can I say it is time to change. It is time to break free from the tyranny of stress and pressure. Well, what is stress? Well, stress is a natural human response to pressure. And we all experience pressure from time to time. Pressures such as life changes, relationship difficulties, these are the types of things that cause stress. Um, financial problems, children, family. But one of the major causes of stress are the demands that other people place on us or the demands that we place on ourselves. Sometimes, though, I have to admit, pressure does come from situations or circumstances that are beyond our control. A job loss, an illness, an injury, a death of a loved one. These are stresses that, that are added to us. And just a case in point, a couple of years ago, my mum, who, lived in, who lives in Wynnum, um, slipped and broke a hip. My father called an ambulance and the ambulance officer decided after looking at my dad, he said, hey, you're coming to hospital as well. And there was no one else around to, to help them and support them in their uh, visit in hospital. So as soon as I found out, I left work, raced up to the hospital and, and basically spent quite a bit of time with mum and dad. Mum in one ward and dad in another. It was quite bizarre. I got home about seven or eight o'clock at night and anyway, I was feeling pretty pretty wrung out from the day and uh, quite stressed about their, the way they were feeling, only to find that my evil dogs, my evil dogs, there they are, Georgia and Sophie, had eaten a whole packet of chocolate royals and a slab of Cadbury dark chocolate, I mean a whole slab, and a packet of lint chocolates on top of that. Now, of course, if you have dogs, you'll understand and know that, that's right, it's poison for dogs, especially little ones like those uh, to, uh, to do. Now, my heart rate lifted to another level. I rang the emergency uh, vet in Logan and I was told that it would cost about $1,000 to take them down for them to be on an intravenous drip and da-da-da-da-da. I thought, hmm, $1,000, that's a lot of money. So I got a second opinion, as you do, when you're faced with bills. And I rang my local vet on the emergency number and he said, look, look, get them to vomit. The saline solution, da 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 da, down their throat, da da da, and I won't go on about it today. But basically, I got them to vomit, disgusting, evil, and keep an eye on them. And in the morning, if their, their heart rate's higher than 200, rush them down to the local vet, rush, rush them down to the vet. They survived the night, which was amazing. And I thought, wow, I've saved $1,000, fantastic. No, I didn't think that. <laughs> One of the dogs, the white dog, Sophie, I checked its heartbeat, 250 beats a minute. I couldn't even, it was so fast. I thought, right, threw the dog in the car. Oh boy, I was still stressed at that time. Threw the dog in the car, raced out of the vet. The vet, um, I put the dog on the counter. The nurse checked the heartbeat, get it on an intravenous vet, do this, do that. Oh my gosh, it was amazing that particular day. And uh, you know, can you believe it? The dog just survived. <laughs> it was only uh, day, uh, moments away from death actually. And uh, the dog stayed there for three days, and uh, thankfully, yes, it survived the ordeal, and they still live to tell the tale. Well, I do anyway. But do you have days like that, where just everything seems to be going wrong, and something happens, another thing happens, another thing happens, and you know, you're, you're, you're in the world of the 21st century, you're in the, the, the world of stress. Generally, when we experience stress, it, our minds become ultra-focused, don't they? They, they, they focus entirely on the pressure. Our heart rate and our blood pressure rises. We feel a tension in our stomach. We, we sweat a bit more. We, we might become irritable and easily angered and our thoughts can race and, you know, we lose sleep. Has anyone sort of experienced those sort of symptoms when you're feeling stressed? To top it off, research indicates that 
Unresolved long-term stress leads to heart damage and other possible physical and mental illnesses such as breakdowns and depression. Dr. Joel Elks writes, our mode of life itself, the way we live, is emerging as today's principal cause of illness. Sometimes when the pressure becomes too great, we burst like a balloon that's overfilled. We lose it. We drop our bundle. We crumble emotionally. We become irrational. We throw tantrums. We do something stupid or we just plain give up. Anybody ever had a moment like that where the stress becomes just too much? I think of, I think of this wonderful story in Acts 27 where Paul and, these, and Luke and the sailors were, were out there on the, on the open seas and they were experiencing a storm that was just beyond their capabilities of managing. And this storm lasted for many, many days. And it says in verse 20 of Acts 27, we finally gave up hope. And isn't it interesting? We finally, the writer himself says, we finally gave up hope. Luke himself, the great apostle Luke, had given up hope. He, I mean, the stress, the, the, the tension of, of the experience was just too much. They'd just given up. The unrelenting pressure became too much for them to bear. Look, what is clear this morning to me, and I hope to yourself, is that we need to deal with stress in our lives because the reality is that it does us no good at all. And I want to provide you with two fairly simple key strategies that have helped me and will help you better to manage or even reduce stress levels in 2013. Firstly, I want to encourage you to simplify your life. Simplify your life. And Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Firstly, in order to simplify, you need to decide that you are going to simplify. You need to choose that path. Charles Wagner said this in the 19th century, by the way, amid the confused relentlessness of modern life, our wearied minds dream of simplicity. You know, most people I know want a simple life. They want it simplified. They want more breathing room. They want a slower place, less clutter. The reality is, though, that life is complex, isn't it? There's no easy way to a, simplify, uh, to a simpler life. So where do you begin? Where do you begin? Well, the scripture says we stand at the crossroad. We're looking, we're asking, where is the good way? I believe from the outset, simplifying our life requires us to examine closely our situation, to examine what we're doing with our time with our life and ultimately deciding for the sake of our health and our sanity what needs to be done to achieve this. What is it going to take for you to choose a simpler life? Can I just say that we never drift towards simplicity? We never drift towards it. I don't know if you've noticed that. We must pursue it. We must work at it. My garage is a case in point. For some reason it naturally drifts into disorder. And it adds to my stress levels, especially when I can't find this tool or that screw or whatever. And so a few weeks back, I looked at my garage, I stood at the crossroads, and I said, that's it, I've had enough. It's time to simplify, declutter, and chuck. I love that word. It's one of my favourite words in life. Chuck. My wife says, what do you think about this? Chuck. I don't even look at it anymore. What about this? Chuck. I'm in the... I'm in the process of simplifying my life. Secondly, in order to simplify, you must know your values. This is really important. Mindy Caligia says, simplicity means taking action to align one's interior world with one's interior, sorry, one's interior world with one's interior values and commitment to God. I believe that when your values are clear, decisions are easier to make. Where we go, what we do, whom we spend time with, what we say yes or no to should be based on what you regard as vitally important in your life, on what you highly value. What is the good way? What is the good way, Jeremiah says? Isn't it to have a vibrant, growing relationship with God? 
to have a great marriage, to, be, to have a strong family, to have a God-pleasing ministry, doing what he has asked you to do, to, have a, to be physically fit, to have a meaningful career, to be able to rest and refresh. What are your core values? What is really important to you? What is God asking you to do with your life? Perhaps it's appropriate to ask yourself, am I trying to achieve too much? Am I trying to do too much? Is my schedule overloaded? Do I have too many commitments? Too many, too many things to do, people to see and places to be. And here's another question for you. What shouldn't I be doing? You know, what do you need to do to stop doing to get some sanity, order and peace in your life? Perhaps we need to learn to say no. I don't know if you have trouble with that. Sometimes I do. No to over-functioning. No to requests to do things that might overload your life. Maybe we should say or instead of and to our children sometimes. Lance Witt, in his masterpiece book, Replenish, says that we must be proactive and preemptive in guarding our lives from complexity. And thirdly, in order to simplify, you need to develop a new rhythm in your life. From the Broadway musical Sweet Charity came what is, well known, what is now a well-known song. The rhythm of life is a powerful thing. And I've come to believe this. I came across this term rhythm when I was reading a book by Bob Merritt called When Life's Not Working. And the word rhythm speaks of order, of routines, of regular disciplines, of pace, of tempo, of balance, of limits. Jesus himself had rhythm and order in his life. He worked hard, but he knew his limits and would often slip away to pray early in the morning, Mark 1.35, or rest or spend time just with the disciples, even when the crowds were pressing in on him. Luke chapter 12, we read that during the week in our readings. And Luke chapter 12, where the crowds were pressing in on Jesus and the Bible says that they're even trampling over one another. But Jesus needed to talk to the disciples and so he talked to the disciples first, the Bible says. I was impressed with Jesus' I guess, um, peace in that situation and his ability to focus on, at that time, what was important to him. Developing a new rhythm is all about looking at your calendar and your routines and using your time to better focus on what's really important. This morning, I want to briefly mention two core values which every Christian should have as part of their rhythm. And the first is worshipping, reading, meditating on scripture, Journaling and praying, I think, is critically important as part of a, a rhythm that you should have, a routine, a daily routine. Can I ask you, what is your devotional life like? How, how is your prayer life? Now, I know mine has ebbed and flowed, ranging from mediocre to great. But I determined some time back that if I'm to have a close relationship with God, which is my highest priority, then I need, I need to spend time with him each day. I'm also learning that if I'm to deal with stress in my life, and I have struggled from time to time with stress, then I need to bring everything to him in prayer. It's interesting that scripture is clear when it, says, when, when it talks about stress, when it talks about when we're feeling stressed or burdened, we should be coming to God in prayer. Why? Well, because we need his perspective. We need his comfort. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. We need his peace. We, need, we cope much better when we give our anxieties to him. And of course, Paul, writing from prison in Rome, a man who knew a great deal about pressure and stress, pens these words in Philippians 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, but in everything, I love that, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You see, he says here, bring everything to God. Give your problems, your pressures to him, and thankfully, 
He says, uh, as the scripture goes on, if you do, you will experience peace. Henry Cloud's father experienced, uh, established a, a successful business in his late 30s. He worked long hours. He was also overweight, significantly overweight, and he, by his own admission, was a constant worrier. He worried a lot. At 40, he went to the movies with his wife and collapsed and was unconscious. They couldn't revive him at that time. They revived him in hospital uh, with what was considered to be a suspected heart attack. Tests confirmed that he only had six months to live at best. So he thought, well, like my dog situation, he got a second opinion from a different hospital. And they basically said that if you're willing to change your lifestyle, get rid of the stress, you may survive. He immediately did so, and as part of the new rhythm in his life, he knocked off at 5.30 every day. And he spent at least half an hour every day with God. He, he read the scripture and he prayed and he gave all of his worries, all of his cares, all of the concerns that he had to the Lord in that half an hour. He determined to give all his stresses and worries to God, I guess obeying in simplicity the scripture, everything by prayer and supplication. Henry Cloud's dad died in 2010 at the ripe old age of 94. Charles Swindoll says, the happiest people I know are the ones who have learned to hold everything loosely and have given the worrisome, stress-filled details of their lives into God's keeping. I love that. The second critically important part of your routine, your rhythm, should be rest and refreshment. Many people believe that if they slow down to rest, they will have a feeling of guilt uh, or they're not being, that they're not being productive. Are you like that? Where you just, hey, I can't slow down. I can't rest because I feel guilty. I just don't, it doesn't feel right. Others just find it hard to relax. They just can't sit still. They just cannot just relax. According to a recent research, you may have seen this in the newspaper, a third of Australians, on average, work longer hours than any other developed nation in the world. I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, Australians, sorry, work longer hours than any other nation in the world. And a third of those don't take annual holidays. My neighbour is a case in point. He's only a young fellow, probably late 30s, and he already has something like 30 weeks of, of, holiday, leave, of annual leave owing to him. He won't take it. What is going on? I think as part of a stress-less rhythm, we need to build into our schedule times of rest and refreshing. And God modelled this for us, didn't he? By resting on the seventh day. He didn't need to rest. Can you imagine God resting? He didn't need to. But he did it as, a, as an example um, for us to follow. Jesus also required rest and Encouraged his disciples to do this. Sorry, to do the same in Mark six thirty one. Come with me by yourselves, he says, to a quiet place and get some rest. This means good sleep, taking breaks, taking holidays. It means doing things that recharge you and fill your bin. It means turning your phone and computer off for a while, which is hard to do. One of the best things my wife and I did a couple of years ago was go out for tea and talk about what refreshes us and what drains us. In completing a list beforehand, my list was this long and my wife's list was that long. No, but I was able to clearly identify what it is that really refreshes me. I'm different to you. But I knew that going to a Lions game was one of those. And I have to say I'm looking forward to the season ahead. Go the Lions. I have a friend, a colleague at work, and who survived the ordeal of cancer in his life, and he has learned to simplify. And 
He loves God with all his heart, but at certain times of the week, he'll be, bowl, he'll be at the bowling alley, always aiming for 300 every time. Wayne Cadero says, rest is not an afterthought. It has to, has to be a primary responsibility. What do you do to rest and refresh? When I was in the United States, I was introduced to In-N-Out Burger. Anyone been there? In-N-Out Burger. What a great place. If you ever go there, please go and visit In-N-Out Burger. Their menu, their menu is simple. They sell hamburgers, fries and soft drink. That's it. The food is just quality, if you can say junk food is quality. Anyway. The French fries are freshly cut. <laughs> the service is exceptional. The taste is amazing. They are clear about who they are and aren't. And the result is simplicity, focus, and an incredible burger experience. I, I think we can learn something from this business on how to live our life. And secondly, two key points today. I believe you need to get support around stress. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6, Paul writes, but God who comforts us, comforts the downcast, comforts us, comforted us, I beg your pardon, by the coming of Titus. Not only is it vital that we simplify our life, but I also believe wholeheartedly in the need to connect with others if you want to break free from stress. Do you have a Titus, a friend or coach who can talk to you, who can comfort you, who can refresh your soul, who can encourage you? A recent experiment involved monkeys, involving monkeys highlighted the value of a friend in stressful times. One monkey was placed in a simulated stressful environment with flashing lights and all its vitals were up. And then they placed a second monkey, a second monkey into the cage. And guess what? The vitals, blood pressure and other things immediately dropped. Dr. Henry Cloud in his excellent book, and I recommend it, The Law of Happiness, says that when people have strong people support systems, in, they are physically healthier with stronger immune systems and emotionally healthy, healthier with less stress, depression and anxiety. That's incredible. So I'll rephrase the question, who's your monkey? We need help to discern where the stress and pressure is coming from in our lives. We, we need help to navigate a path of change for us. We need a person who, who might be wiser, uh, more experienced in our lives to help us perhaps get our priorities right and get our devotional life in order. Help us with our parenting issues or help us to let go of things. We may need a health and fitness expert to help us uh, build good exercise habits into our life. We may need to talk to someone how we're, about how we're feeling emotionally and get support around that. My wife and I went to a, uh, a recommended financial consultant in late 2011 and it was the best thing I could have done because I was struggling with stress around our finances. And this person really helped us to make wise and prudent decisions and helped us map out a plan to follow for the next season of our life. In Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, he, he describes Robin, life on Robben Island where he and other political prisoners were, were, had spent almost 30 years. He reminisces on the relationships that tightened during those years of intense suffering. And he writes this, the authorities' greatest mistake was to keep us together. For together our determination was reinforced. We supported each other and gained strength from each other. Whatever we knew, whatever we learned, we shared and by sharing we multiplied whatever courage we had individually. That is not to say that we were all alike in our responses to hardships we suffered. Men have different capacities and react differently to stress. But the stronger ones raised up the weaker ones 
and both became stronger in the process. I love that statement. The stronger ones raised up the weaker ones and both became stronger in the process. Nelson Mandela learned that you can't make it through life without a few by your side. I love the scripture in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 to 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labour. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. And Edward Farrell writes this, there are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before. We need those certain people in our life I'll, we, who we can be honest with, who can play a key role in our de-stressing. I want to encourage you in this area. Seek it out. Seek out a, a Titus, someone who can support you. In, just in concluding this morning, in November 2011, Australian company Boopa released a series of ads that came with the tagline, what would you do if you met a healthier version of yourself? The people in the ads are, are normal Australian people, everyday Australians who experience a variety of illnesses. I, I don't have time to go into each one. But the ads depict themselves in their unwell well state, meeting themselves in a healthier state. I wonder if you're going to see a healthier and happier you in the not too distant future as you seek to deal with stress in your life. I wonder today if we could begin the process of decluttering, the process of simplifying, of looking at what we're doing, perhaps considering our priorities, realigning our calendars to focus on what is important and what God is asking us to do in 2013. What do you need to do to live simpler this year? And who could you talk to about your situation? Who can be your Titus in 2013? I don't believe God intended us for us, sorry, for us to live out stressed, angry, irritable lives. He wants us to live happily and experience his peace. Perhaps you're here today and you don't know Christ. You don't know Jesus. You're not a Christian yet. I can certainly vouch for the fact that coming to Christ is a significant first step to breaking free, a first step to breaking free from the tyranny of stress over your life. And if you've not yet made that commitment, I want to encourage you and invite you to come forward for prayer as we close the service in a few moments. And perhaps there are others today who you would like some prayerful support around a very stressful situation. I also want to invite you to come forward for prayer. I really sensed at the beginning of this service that God wants to do some wonderful things in the lives of people here this morning. He wants you to break free from the tyranny, the pain, the pressure. I'm not saying the pressure will disappear altogether, but perhaps our coping mechanisms can improve. Let's just pray. Father, thank you this morning. You promise us to have rest. You promise rest and peace for our souls. Help us to choose the right path. Help us to live simpler. Help us to follow your example. There were times to work hard, but there were times where you rested. There were times when you prayed and sought your, fa sought your Father's face. Will we just commit ourselves to your fresh? Give us wisdom, insight. Give us a, a, a real determination that this year will be different that this year we are going to focus on what is critically important in our life. And first and foremost, we have a desire to meet with you daily. We want to be in your presence, Lord. We need you.